Welcome back to another episode of the Leading Saints podcast. And today I'm welcoming in Steve Wilwright. How are you? Terrific. How are you? Good. Now, uh, many people may not realize we'll need a link to this, but we've done an interview before, but just not this podcast, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> we talked, uh, that was for the Latter-day Saint MBA podcast. We right. talked about your time as uh, you were president of BYU Hawaii for yep. ma- many years and you're at Harvard and... I mean, just your business career and all things, and so we'll link to that. Yeah. People really want to dig in there. So, but we're we're back, but n- not to talk about you for the That's most right. part. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now, you are. Uh, what, what's your role with the Wilford Woodruff Papers? Uh, I'm an advisor, okay. and I'm involved in the fundraising side. Nice. But I I basically am an ex officio member of the board. Okay. All right. <laughs> now, I think many. Probably most Latter Day Saints are familiar with Joseph Smith papers. Uh, you know right. they've been going for so long. Just concluded that effort. Um, so what are the Wilford Woodruff papers? So Wilford Woodruff wrote ten times what Joseph Smith ever wrote. In fact, Joseph Smith didn't write much. He often had a scribe or somebody who would record. Mm-hmm. But about thirty percent of the Joseph Smith papers are what Wilford Woodruff wrote down because he was there. Wow. And he kept better notes than anybody else. So from the day he was baptized in 1833 until he died in 1898 as the president of the church, he kept a journal. And that journal is the best record of the pioneer restoration, all the things that went on, the temple work, everything else that was developed from the time of Joseph Smith from 1833 onward. Yeah. And, and, you know, just by, uh, you know, not that I've done a deep dive on Wilford Woodruff, but I've read the, the Saints volumes. And I think it's volume two of Saints that really gets into his administration correct, and some of his life. Uh, then I just, uh, now the, uh, the one about Temple Doctrine. Yeah. But, so Wilford Woodruff's Witness, The Development of Temple Doctrine. That's right. Yes. This is a book by Jennifer Mackley, who is heading up the Wilford Wo- Woodruff Papers Project. And she is the expert on Wilford Woodruff, everything he wrote, Mm -hmm. everything that's still available, where it is. And she wrote that book based on Wilford Woodruff's record of having been the first real temple president. So he was the temple president of St. George while he was president of the Quorum of the Twelve. I think, was that the the first president of St. George? He was the first president. So it opened in, I think it was January of 1877. Uh, and he was there until he became basically the prophet. Yeah. Yeah. And and just like looking at his life and learning more, you know, I go back to the decision of uh, of ending polygamy. Just like that was such a lose-lose situation. And yeah. as far as like leadership goes, <laughs> like what an example of leadership. He had to really look at some hard facts, obviously seek out direction and yep. revelation and whatnot. But to make that decision, I mean, he, he had the government against him and a lot of the membership of the church <laughs> to really move out and, and make that decision. And, and both sides were not happy with it. Uh, yeah. Turns out that he was really prepared to do that. I mean, he'd been there from before it started to when it got underway. Yeah. He then had additional wives besides Phoebe, his first wife, uh, and then he was the one that ended it. Yeah, it's fascinating. So anytime there's an opportunity to discuss Wilford Woodruff, now I <laughs> have such a, a soft spot in my leadership heart for Wilford Woodruff <laughs> because from the moment he was baptized, I mean, the guy just didn't stop. You know, he yeah. was being sent on missions. He was, you yep. know, called as an apostle, then in, you know, temple presencies, then, you know, leading the He was the even church. the church historian officially wow. for, for several years. Uh, but his record is the record that, people refer to during mm-hmm. about 1833 to 1898 because yeah. that's where he never missed a thing. Yeah. In fact, when when Brigham Young uh, was uh, picking the t- site for the Salt Lake Temple, he t- takes a few of the apostles with him. And, of course, the only person that brought a stake and a hammer to hammer it in with was Wilford. <laughs> Always and, prepared. And yeah. he, he gets there and he says, this is where it's going to be. And he turns to Wilford. He said, Wilford, mark this, will you? <laughs> of course, he knew Wilford was ready to mark it because yeah. that's what Wilford did. Yeah. And he really, I mean, that apprentice to Brigham Young in so many ways. Yeah. And by the time in, in just reading the book, like it was sort of a like President Kimball situation where 
uh, John Taylor was younger than Wilford Woodruff, and right. I think he assumed that uh, John Taylor would outlive would, him. Yeah, you know? yeah. And here he is as the prophet for many years, yeah. and, and the influence on on temple doctrine and all those things. So, so like going back to the Wilford Woodruff papers, like now this isn't like a this is a independent organization apart from the church, right? Right. How, Except how that, that the church is clearly, well. The church did the Joseph Smith papers because it was Joseph Smith. Right. And they decided to publish hard copies, which means you better have everything exactly right before you do it. <laughs> yeah, it can take some resources. Because you can't go back. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they ended up having uh, a single major donor who paid for most of that. Mm -hmm. They decided on the other prophets that we should let groups of Latter-day Saints do this, uh, because everybody should be anxiously engaged anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but the church, we assume, will eventually take over all of this. But we're only publishing on website, on the website that we have. Gotcha. So we've published 25,000 papers, pages already. Uh, you know, but we've got another <laughs> probably 12,000 to go. But we're also publishing all the names mentioned in his record all of the places mentioned in his record, all of, so that the subjects were indexing everything so that they're searchable. So yeah, it's gonna be, yeah. if you wanna know what went on in the church between 1833 and 1898, go look at Wilfred yeah, Woodruff's the papers. He's yeah. the guy. And so the, the general effort is to organize all that he's written into a way that obviously we can learn from and then it can be easily yeah. researched further for different projects, right? Yeah. So one thing I, I learned recently that I hadn't heard before was he gave about 4,000 discourses, uh, but he never wrote those down. Hmm. Now, he would write in his journal, oh, this was one of my best ones, <laughs> lasted 22 minutes. And then he'd tell, tell who spoke before him or after him and how long they spoke. And he'd oh, talk wow. about what they said, but he didn't talk about what he said. Uh, because he never wrote out his discourses. Interesting. Just stood at the lectern he, and went. He, huh? he believed that uh, he should only preach by the Spirit. Wow. So he didn't write them down. Yeah, and, and <laughs> nobody had a tape recorder back then. So yeah. <laughs> to, so, to... so one of the things that the Wilfred Woodruff Papers is doing is going back to stake conference records. I mean, all sorts of records. General conference. The general conference ones people took pretty good notes and they'd kind of triangulate. So they'd have multiple people take notes and, but yeah, that's all part of the project. Yeah. It's that's, great. That's fun. And uh, just a side, you know, factoid here that uh, Wilford Woodruff is the uh, first modern day prophet to record his voice on a, on a recorder of some type. And he testified yeah. of the prophet Joseph Smith. You can find it on, on YouTube. I've, yeah. I've listened to yeah. it. It's awesome. Yeah. It's great. So, <laughs> it's really cool. So do you have a personal connection with Wilford Woodruff? I don't. Other than Except you believe he was a prophet. I know he was a prophet. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Cool. I've read a lot of his stuff now. That's great. <laughs> so uh, in this, uh, we can pivot into the, sort of the crux of our conversation today. Just the, I, I love learning about the life of leaders to see how, you know, with hindsight, we can look back and really see how yeah. the Lord was shepherding them along and developing them into the the character they needed to be in order to be a prophet, you know, yeah. and yeah. Uh, you've uh, done some presentation research about his his missions, the, the many, many missions yeah. that, that he did. Where's a good jumping off point? Well, I, I actually think I wish there were two other books that had been written and hopefully they'll get written. The, the one on temple doctrine is terrific yeah. because he recorded, you know, when did we get white clothing? When did we get this? When did we get that? All those things are in there. But he also, missionary work, there was no better missionary than Wilford Woodruff. Yeah. And he'd go wherever he was called, and he'd speak up and everything else. That's, And we'll talk about that in just a minute. The third one, though, is polygamy, mm -hmm. because he was there before, during, and after. And his record is a far better record, I think, of what was it like? Why did things change? How did they change? How did the Lord intervene to protect the church, to protect the people, and all of that? So, yeah. But let's talk about the missionary work. Yeah, let's do it. He, he was looking. He didn't join the church until he was 26. And it was December 31st, uh, 1833, that he joined the church. 
and he had been looking for truth. And I remember so he, the old seminary video about yeah. about Wilford Woodruff. He, he got, was looking for prophets and apostles, right? Yeah, yeah. And when he didn't find him in any of the churches, he he just concluded that can't be the true church. And so, uh, Elder Pulsifer was the missionary. There were two missionaries who came. They hadn't traveled that far. In fact, uh, the missionary who baptized him was out working in his field one day and. The Lord told him, you need to go preach the gospel. He didn't know where. He comes into the house. He tells his wife, I'm going to go preach the gospel. She says, where? He says, I don't know, but the Lord will tell me. He goes about 60 miles, and here are these two brothers who are living together. Uh, now, Wilfred's not married, but his brother, uh, Asman, I think is his name, his brother is married. They listen to Elder Pulsifer, and 24 hours later or so, he's baptized. Wow. He says, this is it. This is what I was looking for, uh, and he's ready to go. Well, three months after that, so now you're in early 1834, this is when the saints were having all that trouble in far west Missouri and uh, things. This is when Zion's camp, as we now know it, mm -hmm. got organized. Well, Parley P. Pratt came recruiting and he comes to upstate New York where uh, Wilford and his brother are and he says Joseph Smith the prophet is looking for 500 men to go redeem Zion whatever that meant right yeah <laughs> <laughs> and Wilford says count me in I'm in and his brother says well I've got a wife and family and I can't go right now and so Wilford goes and he's one of the first to arrive in Kirtland. This is when he first meets the prophet Joseph Smith. So he's only been a member for three months. Um, and he gets sent ahead. They sent kind of an advanced group. So they wanted to get everybody out of uh, Kirtland before they gathered to make their trek. So they, they go to a place called Portage. I don't know how far it is. And now he's ready. And he sees this as a mission. I mean, he, he was called. Yeah. The prophet called. And he's going up for this purpose. That's his first mission. The Zion camp, Zion's camp. Zion's camp, mm -hmm. which he records is just phenomenal. And in fact, <laughs> one of the key lessons he learned, early in his uh, church membership, he was going on all sorts of missions. He went on seven of them in the first about thir 12 or 13 years, seven different missions. And he was going on. But this is the first. Mm -hmm. So, and he's going to be gone probably about eight or nine months because he's one of the ones Joseph Smith asked to stay and help the saints move out of that county. Uh, and he, he's all in. But the lesson he learns on this first one is about consecrated service. And in fact, he does a very interesting thing. He, he actually, one of the saints in the area where where Zion's camp ends up, has an extra room. And they were organized into companies and groups. And somebody in his group says, this member has an extra room and we can all sleep inside instead of outside. Now it had rained hard, all it was yeah. a mess, you know. I can imagine it's pretty miserable. So they all arranged their bedding in this room, kind of preempting everybody else. Well, then cases of cholera develop. Oh boy. And that's where they put all the cholera people. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to have to burn everything they put in the room. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and Wilford makes this, this comment uh, that, you know, I learned a very important lesson. I should consecrate everything to the Lord and not hold back. He said, and I was being selfish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says, I've learned that lesson. Now I'm never going to do that again. And he did. Yeah. And, and to, I mean, if there's a way to summarize his complete life, I mean, talk about consecrated. Yeah. I mean, he gave it all. <laughs> he did. And, uh, <laughs> and he was a hard worker, you know. Well, in so. fact, when he's there in, uh, in uh, Jackson County, he actually records uh, everything that he had because he, he's so detailed every anyway in what he writes down. He only had probably 10 or $15 worth of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Wow. 
That's all he's got, but he consecrates it all. Yeah. He gives it all to the Lord. Yeah. So that Zion's camp experience was the beginning of many, yeah. co- a much consecrated service, right? True. Yep. A- anything else in that world of consecrated service that would be worth mentioning? Or, Well, he, he wants to go on a mission. At, when he was baptized, his brother was older, so his brother gets made a priest and he gets made a teacher. Mm-hmm. Well, he then gets a call to the Southern States Mission with a companion, and uh, they're going to go to Arkansas, Tennessee, and one other state. But the, they have to do everything themselves because, you know, they're, they're just dirt roads. They're, yeah. This is pretty early days. Yeah, there's no organized the, mission or mission president. Yeah, or, so this is yeah. 1834, yeah, yeah. and it's without person script. and. Mm-hmm. So he gets started by saying, I'm going to do this. We're going to go see if we can't convert some people. I guess Kentucky was the other state. Mm. Uh, and so he and his companion first have to dig out a canoe. They hollow out a log. Now, I would think that a log would be re- very rolly. I mean, right, yeah. I can't imagine. And I can't imagine how long that takes. I don't know. To hollow well, out a... they, t- they took a few days to dig it out. Wow. And this actually becomes another characteristic that he learns on his missions, which is the joy of hard work. Yeah. Nobody worked harder than Wilford Woodruff. I mean, he records in his journal when he's about 70 that he's, he says, this is the first day that one of my kids can out hoe me in the garden. <laughs> I mean, he's out there. <laughs> you know, he's an apostle. Yeah. He's out there working in the garden every day. And, and when they went on this mission, one of the things they would do to repay people, they would actually do work for them. So they'd say, need anything built? Need anything cleaned up? You need weeding done? I mean, in the garden, whatever it was. And so, and then they'd come back in and preach at night because they couldn't work because it was dark. And Mm -hmm. so it's very interesting. He clearly learns about hard work and he likes it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, it's almost like an adrenaline rush. Yeah. At least I get that from reading some of his stuff. Yeah, and just reading that uh, Temple Doctrine book of just to the end, like when it came even to temple work, you know, he yeah. was hours and hours in the temple yeah. and, Never and really pounding that drum with the members of the church, being yep. like, we, we've we got a work to do. Like, let's get in the yeah. temple yeah. and help these people uh, that need the ordinances, you know, so. Yeah, one of the things he records on this Southern States mission is they've been gone six or eight months and his, uh, they're in a, swamp it's muddy it's raining and it he gets a sudden sharp pain in his leg and so he sits down on a log and while he's sitting there his companion says i think i'm done i'm going back to kirtland to see my family and leaves him <laughs> Holy cow. and wilford rec- records it as i got down on my knees said a prayer that i'd be blessed that this pain would go away it did I stood up, and even though my companion had left me in a in an alligator swamp, is how he describes it. <laughs> he said, "I went on my way, joyful at the work I was doing." Yeah, you know, and he'd always insert that word "joyful" in there when he said work. All work was joyful to him. Yeah, and it could have been. I mean, a lot this longevity of his life that he was just he never yeah. sat down long enough to die you know he just exactly uh, he just kept going so yeah that's cool and part of this joyful work was he really felt called to record everything that took place and so he said he felt like a fish out of water until he recorded something in his journal that he thought was meaningful and significant hmm. and he'd record everything and then at the end of the year he'd actually do a summary and it was of how many people he'd uh, preached the gospel to or how many people he'd confirmed or baptized or, you know, given a blessing to, and he'd count them. (laughs) Wow. He was just a detailed guy. And with hindsight, such a blessing to the church and church history. Yeah, to know all that. Yeah. 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 Now, obviously, we have, you have a lot of work ahead of you with the Wilfred Woodruff papers. I mean, you asked the the question earlier about the church's role. Mm -hmm. We, we, the Wilfred Woodruff Papers has a partnership with several different church entities. One of them is Family Search, because there are about 20,000 people mentioned in his journals. 
So wow. these are people he crossed paths with. Some of them he knew well. Others of them were just somebody he met. Like on the Southern States mission, after his companion leaves, he goes on into Memphis and he goes, tells a great story, but goes into a, an inn and he records the name of the person, the proprietor. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the names. Well, one of the things that the church is very interested in is if we do little biographical sketches of those, attaching them to the family search record, and then they let the descendants of that person who are already in, as you know, family search is kind of one big family right. tree. Yeah. So anytime you can get somebody identified in that tree, everything downstream that is already connected suddenly becomes, oh, and it turns out that with the people we've identified thus far, there are about 53 million descendants of those people. Wow. Which is pretty remarkable. Yeah. And it, people are interested, you know. Yeah. The work of Elijah is on, going on. Yeah. And th they really want to know about their ancestors. So, yeah. you know, if you knew your ancestor, gosh, he was a proprietor of this inn. And they try and play a trick on Wilford Woodruff at the inn. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's very memorable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's great. And so if you're, if you want to know if your ancestor met Wilford Woodruff, you would probably find that out because he probably recorded it. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, eventually all 20,000 of them, uh, if we can identify, you need a place or a date or something right. to put it in family search, then those people will all be there. And then they'll naturally connect with everybody else who's already there. And yeah. that's, I mean, that's just one example of a partnership with the church. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to, to make those connections. So yeah. Anything else with the joyful hard work? Uh, no, but I will. <laughs> he was never afraid to open his mouth, which is the third thing that's I would right. say it was unique to him. And it starts with, he leaves this alligator swamp. He goes to Memphis to this inn. And he tells the proprietor, now, he's been in the mud. I mean, and he knelt down in the mud to pray. So I'm, Micah says he's a mess. And he yeah. tells the proprietor, <laughs> he says, I don't have any money, but I could you put me up for the night and feed me? And the proprietor asks him, what do you do? I'm a preacher of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. That's uh -huh. what he tells him. And the proprietor thinks, oh, the guys I know that would have a lot of fun with this guy. So he says, sure, I'll do that if you'll preach. Well, Wilford senses that he, he, the guy wants to have him preach so that they can make fun or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so he plays hard to get, which only makes the proprietor more interested in having him preach. <laughs> and nice. so he feeds Wilford. And while he does, the group that the proprietor invites comes. Well, they're all the the big wigs in the town of Memphis at the time, 500 people. So this must have been a big inn. Yeah. But there are 500 people there by the time he's finished. He tries to get them to sing a song, and all the proprietor's friends are right around him, sitting right there, but nobody will sing. Well, Wilford doesn't have a good voice, so he <laughs> reads the words to the hymn, and and then he says the prayer, and then as he gets ready to preach, he the way Wilford records it is he said, the Lord revealed to me who these people were and what kinds of things they had done in their life. So they appeared to be uh, high society, but in fact, there was a lot of shadiness in their lives. So he proceeded to tell them. A little <laughs> repentance. <laughs> and of course... Yeah. And then he's calling him to repentance. Yeah, yeah. But they're shocked. How can he know this? How can this Mormon boy know this? Yeah. And he finishes this. He, he says what he feels inspired to say, calls him to repentance. And, uh, and then he closes with prayer. And within three minutes, he says, there is nobody in the room but him. Oh my goodness! <laughs> All five hundred of them disappear. Where, where are thy, uh, uh, you know, in the the Bible verse, where are thy accusers, right? They're, yeah, where are thy accusers? They're not here. They're, they're not there anymore. And so then he goes up to the room that the the proprietor had given him to sleep in that night. 
well, they've got paper thin walls and the proprietor and his closest friends are in the next room. And they're trying to figure out how did he know? How did he know all that? We've never told anybody all those things. And, uh -huh. You know, and obviously they've been in some of it together and stuff. And so, and Wilford thinks, maybe I should go next door. Maybe they'll be more receptive now. And, and he listens to them and they say, I don't think we want to talk to him any further. We can't trust that what he says won't be even worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so they all leave, and Wilford gets a good night's sleep and then goes on his way the next wow. day. And there's a, just a great example that he's willing to speak what the Lord puts in his heart, right? right. Regardless well, of the Well, in fact, he's willing to open his mouth. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, there's a great set of verses in the Doctrine and Covenants about opening your mouth. And most mission presidents uh -huh. in our mission in London, they called it OYMs. Open so, your mouth. Right? So besides knocking on doors, you stop people on the subway or any public transportation or on the street, and you, and you open your mouth. Uh, and that's how we got a lot of our investigators. Yeah, it's half the battle. your just, mouth. He's got to speak, right? And that's what he did. Yeah. And he was willing to do that anywhere he went. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just thought, yeah, of course I'm going to do that. Why wouldn't yeah. I? And, yeah. and he said what? he was told to say. I'm, another great example of that is when he goes on his mission to England, this is when all of the nine of the apostles go to England, uh, and he's one of those, and his assigned area is Staffordshire. That's where the potteries are, where Wedgwood and all of those people that make fine china and things. Mm -hmm. And so that's his assigned area, he starts preaching in the first month or so to six weeks, month to six weeks. He probably baptizes 40 people or so, and it's going great. And one Sunday, in fact, it's right at his birthday, he preaches. He has three sermons set up that day, and other churches would let him preach until they figured out that he was going to take their converts. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so he's preaching in, in different places. And he gets to the one in the evening, and, he's, and they're singing the opening song, and he gets this impression, this is your last sermon here in the potteries. And so he stands up, he tells the people, I'm sorry to tell you, he's got lots of appointments set up because he's still baptizing people up there. And he says, this will be my last time. Uh, I'm to go somewhere else. And that's what he does. I mean, he, now he doesn't know where he's going at the time. He baptizes some people at the end of that meeting. Uh, and then the next day he goes in a private place and asks the Lord, where am I going? Mm -hmm. He says, south. <laughs> wow. And so he goes south. And that's when he gets to the John Benbow farm. And that's when eventually 1,800 people get baptized because of that because John Benbow and his wife Jane both get baptized. That's the United Brethren that have about uh, the Gadfield Elm Chapel as part of that. So that's why it became the first foreign church building that hmm. the church owned, because the United Brethren gave it to the church when they all joined. Eventually, all but one of those 600 United Brethren in there, obviously there are wives and everything else in there, they all joined except one. <laughs> wow. So they took the, took the building with them, right? <laughs> and, and they gave the building to the church wow. so that people could continue to meet in it. Yeah. But that, that's Wilford being will, willing to open his mouth and do whatever the Lord asks him to do. Yeah. And that's a great lesson. Yeah. That exact obedience concept, right? Yeah. Of just yeah. not only refining your yep. uh, spiritual communication, but by following it. And that's a lot of the refining that happens is yeah. when you're willing to follow it. And that's really, from his early missions, that's the fourth thing that I'd identify was uh, this exact obedience. So one of the great incidents uh, when he's preaching uh, at the Benbow farm, John Benbow and about 40 of these United Brethren were registered preachers. Turns out you had to have a license in Great Britain at the time to preach. You also had to be in a place that was registered 
for Sirm to have this kind of religious thing. Well, John Benbow's farm house had a room that was registered for that. So it was all legal. Well, that's when this constable comes and comes, the, the, a local minister sends his constable to go arrest Wilford Woodruff for preaching. He's actually trying to arrest him so that he won't be able to do sheep stealing, as they called it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so uh, this constable shows up and he, right at the start of the meeting, and he interrupts the meeting and he, he says, are you Wilford Woodruff? And he says, yes. And he said, I'm here to arrest you. And he says, well, on what grounds? Uh, for preaching. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'm about to start. Why don't you just take my chair? He'd been sitting right in the front, sit right here next to me, and I'll, we'll work this out at the end of my preaching. And he comments that this is a registered place and this is all legal and he's got his license. And so he goes ahead and preaches. And then at the end, close, which was very common in, in those missionary days, say, how many are ready for baptism? Well, there were seven or eight people that raised their hands and the constable's one of them. <laughs> oh my goodness. And he baptized him that night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, you know, he was exactly obedient to go there but he also knows that he's supposed to preach this sermon, so he's going to preach it, and then he's going to talk to the constable, you know, so he never gets arrested, but it, there was not, no grounds, really, to yeah. arrest him. Yeah. But the constable didn't know that when he went out there. Yeah, and now, <laughs> now he's, he's a member. Now he's a Latter-day Saint, right? That's, <laughs> That's cool. right. Um, anything else around exact obedience we want to touch on, or is that a good good? No, I, I think that's a, that's a good start, so... Let me just re review. In the first few years, he, the, he had Zion's camp. That's 1834. He goes to the Southern States Mission at the end of 1834, beginning of 1835. Um, he gets made an elder, ordained an elder, okay, partway through his mission. So now he can do confirming as well. Uh -huh. uh, then in 1837, uh, he marries Phoebe. Uh, so that's Phoebe Carter, who, you know, it's uh, they're both signed up as new converts, and she is just like he is in terms of anywhere the Lord wants us to go, anything he wants us to do, we're ready to do it. Yeah. And, you know, their great support to each other and so on. And they go to the eastern states in the Fox Islands. And he had been anxious to get this mission call because his patriarchal blessing had told him that he would preach the gospel on the Isles of the Sea. Well, it turns out that the Fox Islands in Maine, the other Isles of the Sea, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, it was also near where her family lived and some of his relatives lived. And so this mission was perfect because he ends up baptizing several members of her family, several members of his extended family, and also baptizing several families uh, in the Fox Islands. He has lots of opposition, but you know he's figuring out nothing's going to stop me now. And then they're going to move to Missouri with this group. And so they leave at the end of the mission. They leave uh, and take this group. And that's when Phoebe uh, dies. And then she is given the choice by the Lord. If you'll stick with Wilford wherever it leads, you can go back or you can stay. That is stay in the spirit world. She decides to go back. Oh, wow. Well, he's so much in tune that He'd already offered her to the Lord when they thought she was dead. But then he senses that something's changed, and so he gives her a blessing. And she, here she comes. Yeah. Here she comes. <laughs> and she recalls, she recounts to him her being in the room with these two angels who uh, give her this choice. And she's all in. Yeah. She's back. And then they continue on their way. And then a 
they have a, and he does his mission to England after that. That's in 1839 to 1841. He then goes to a mission to the Eastern States. In fact, he does two of them. And on the second one of those is when the prophet is martyred. So he's not there. He's in the Eastern States. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, 1845, he's called as a European mission president, and he and Phoebe take their family with them to Europe. Wow. To preside basically at the British Isles. I mean, that's where they were, and to preside over that mission for a couple of years. Yeah. And at this time, he's an apostle as well. Is that right? Yes. He mm -hmm. was made an apostle. He, he got the word uh, from Thomas B. Marsh, who was uh, the president of the quorum, sent him a letter while he was in the Fox Islands. But he hasn't been ordained. He actually goes too far west. This is that revelation that Joseph Smith had received that the apostles are to leave from far west, even though it's now in basically enemy hands. Hmm. You know, the detractors from the church were in charge. And so they do it at 2 a.m. But he actually gets ordained an apostle uh, along with a couple of the other uh, apostles on the cornerstone of the temple site because that's all there is at the temple site really? at that time. And then that's where, and then they go back to Kirtland to leave on their mission. So, but he, exact obedience. He does, the Lord said it was supposed to be in far west, so we're going to far west. Yeah, and, yeah. Brigham Young and a couple of the other apostles are who ordain him an apostle. Yeah. And then at the the end of the, I mean, he sort of just goes from being a missionary, becomes an apostle, and then that launches him off to a yeah. different uh, season well, of life with temples yeah. and Well, and he's, he's in charge of uh, one of the pioneer companies. You know, mm. he goes back and forth a couple of times. He's He's all in. Yeah, he's, never stops. <laughs> he never, never stops. stops. <laughs> uh, any, anything else about his missionary years that, that would be worth mentioning, or do we give a good summary there? No, I, th I think, you know, these, these things that he learned about conse consecrated service, and in fact, any mission president would love to have a missionary who said, <laughs> well, the things I've been working on are consecrated ser service, joyful hard work, you know, opening my mouth, being willing to do whatever the Lord wants me to do. Uh, and what was the... F the uh, exact obedience. The exact right? obedience. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a mission president, that's like <laughs> you died and went to heaven. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> and Wilford learned all of those, and he's he practices them. So you see it over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And, and again, he just, uh, you know, feeds into his leadership and blesses yeah. him and the church for, for decades to come. So, yeah. Um, anything else worth mentioning as far as the, I know that's a whole, maybe a whole nother podcast or not, but the later years of temple work, St. George well, Temple. Well, some of the things you see in this are that, uh, so he was one of four apostles that was asked to memorize all of the temple ordinances in Nauvoo. Uh, and he then becomes, he kind of runs the endowment house in Salt Lake, but it was only doing live ordinances. Mm-hmm. When the uh, temple in St. George is ready, Brigham Young calls him to be the president of the temple. He then works with Brigham and a couple of others. That's the first time they write down the ordinances. Prior to that, everybody memorized them. Yeah, and we're talking like six, seven hours worth. Oh of, yeah, I mean they this were long and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so he writes them down. And he becomes basically the steward of all things temple at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, it's later that, that's 1877, when the temple is uh, dedicated, it, it, like they had with Nauvoo, they dedicate the baptistry first, and they, as it gets more done, they dedicate more of it. Uh, but in uh, August of 1877 is when the founding fathers and several prominent men and women come to him in the temple uh, and basically say, why aren't you doing our work? Yeah. And this, of course, leads him to do the research to figure out who's who. He actually adds some people to the list that he 
the Lord tells him, you ought to do this work for all of these. And so there are lots of them that he does. Mm -hmm. But then he begins to start looking at, well, what about all the work that needs to be done? And uh, prior to this time, they had not had uh, people do work other than for their own ancestors. And of course, he's now going to be an avid genealogist. Yeah. And he ends up doing, having the work done for 3,000 plus of his ancestors. But a lot of that was because he also goes to the Lord and he says, how am I going to get this done? And the Lord says, well, let other people help you. And that's when they start, oh, you mean somebody who's done their own ordinances could come and do it for somebody else that isn't a relative Yeah, and all of that. So, yeah, that I mean, he's so tenacious about things and he wants to do it exactly the way the Lord wants it done. And so you can see this continually refinement of temple ordinances, Mm -hmm. much more by 1898. And of course, he's going to then be in charge of making sure that the Manti Temple, the Logan Temple, and the Salt Lake Temple all are following the standards that have been set in St. George, Mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. You know? Became a model that blessed the following temples, right? Yeah. He then... Obviously, once he becomes the prophet, when John Taylor passes away, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. We now all know what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, He knew what was supposed to happen, but it turned out that because of polygamy and the pressure that the United States, the United States had already started taking assets and arresting people and everything else who are polygamous. So... And then they're going to get even more severe. But initially, when he becomes, when John Taylor dies, uh, it's about, must be about 1887, uh, he doesn't get made the prophet. But he is the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. So he's effectively running the church. But he can't get the apostles to agree, some of them, Mm -hmm. on his counselors. And in fact, even one of the young ones comes to him and suggests somebody else ought to be the prophet. Oh, wow. (laughs) And tells him who it should be. Uh (laughs) But he is so committed to, we're going to do this the way the Lord wants it done, and that means we have to be unified. But he also is committed to, I need these counselors and George Q. Cannon was one of those, and that was the issue. Was, uh, George Q. Cannon was the smartest room guy in the room, and everybody knew it, including George. <laughs> and it drove other people nuts. <laughs> but he also knew Washington, D.C. He knew the law. He knew what uh, the government could and couldn't do. And, and They have to pass a law to do this because they can't do it just because they say they want to do it. And so he desperately wanted him and knew the Lord wanted him. Hmm. Well, it took not quite two years from the time John Taylor died before the first presidency gets organized in October of 89. And that was because they weren't unified. And he would have, towards the end of that period, he knew they had to get organized because he knew that polygamy and the issues around it because they were about to take the temples. Yeah, right. And he said, we have to have a first presidency. And so he would have 12, 14-hour meetings with the 12. Of course, now they're in hiding, so you got to do it yeah. <laughs> like that. It's tricky. And they do several days of those, and finally— Everybody feels the spirit and says, absolutely, this is right. We're all with you. And so October conference, there's a new first presidency. Yeah. And, you know, it's only a year later before the manifesto. So yeah, that you was really, really needed crucial. a first presidency to do that. Yeah. But he was patient. I mean, but he knew he wanted to do it the way the Lord wanted it done. And that mm-hmm. was unified. Yeah. Everybody's got to be on board. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, just reading generally about his life, 
like from a leadership standpoint, just to see the, you know, just like those situations where there's this, this uh, push and pull with decisions. Yeah. And we like to think that he woke up and <laughs> he said, thus saith the Lord, this is the direction we're going. But, yeah. and I think in modern day leadership, we have to be okay with someone that's like, man, why can't I get the relief side yeah. over on my side? You know, yeah. but, but no, this is part of the, the consecration, the yep. sanctification that happens of getting in and working it out and yeah. we become better people because of it. And why does yeah. it take so long? I mean, people often will comment on the church as being a very conservative organization in terms of rates of change. Now, President Nelson doesn't look like that, <laughs> but people would consider him conservative. But you also have to know that he would never have done all the things that people consider changes in the way we carry out the gospel and Mm -hmm. the way the church functions unless it had been revealed by the Lord because President Nelson wouldn't have done it and all of the apostles agreed. Yeah. So yeah, it's a beautiful system. Yeah. It's a great system. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, any, if people want to kind of jump into the Wilford Woodruff papers and I mean, what's available now and what, I mean, what, Oh, what would you encourage people to do? 25,000 pages have been published. Uh, there, there are three things you might think about doing. Obviously, okay. we use volunteers and interns extensively. Now, the interns are paid part-time students. So they're particularly, you know, think of all your favorite institutions. And yes, we have them from there too. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so we probably have 50 or 60 interns. And they're terrific because they're very well trained. They love it. Uh, It's strengthening their testimony, but they then also help train our volunteers and pair with our volunteers. When we we get to the second stage of, uh, first of all, you have to transcribe everything. And we're doing letters now, for example, that are mission calls or those people responding to their mission call, which are fascinating letters. So these are, Wilford Woodruff wrote the letter calling them and they're writing back saying, well, I can't go right now, or yeah, I'll drop everything and go, or you know, th- here's my situation, could I wait for a few months? And, and then he writes back to him. So there's all of that kind of thing going mm-hmm. on. But b- being involved in the transcription, the verification, uh, and getting it published online, we'd love those volunteers. So that's one thing to do. Cool. And it's more interesting than indexing, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is still important, but... Uh, and yeah. you can do it remotely. So cool. uh, my wife does some with our daughter where she's in Texas and, you know, they've got their cell phones on, they're at their computers, but they're looking at the same thing on their computers. It's an edit system and that we yeah. do everything on. So uh, that's one kind of involvement. A second kind of involvement is we have a newsletter uh, and we have all of these partnerships with other people and they're identified in the newsletter. So if you want to know what's exciting and what's recently been found and that kind of thing, you just go to our website, sign up for the newsletter, and we'll send you every month. You'll get a newsletter and it'll have quotes from Milford Woodruff and... uh, I'll mention one of the partnerships that we're doing now that is fascinating is for Come Follow Me because next year we do the Book of Mormon, then we're going back to church history. Mm -hmm. Well, all of the things, by the time we get there, 90% of them will have been published on the website, so they'll all be referenced in Come Follow Me. So anytime Wilford Woodruff was involved or recorded or did something in connection with that section of the Doctrine and Covenants or this topic that's in Come Follow Me in that year, 2025, it'll have a footnote saying, go to this part, this place, and you'll be able to read the original and see what went on. That's cool. Which is really cool. Uh, And of course, you can donate. That's the third thing. Absolutely. Because we're paying these interns. (laughs) That's where most of the money we raising is going and they've really quickened the pace of the project and in fact now we're sharing with some of the other projects the church has going on or partnering partnering 
with like the Brigham Young Papers and other uh, groups uh, because the interns have turned out to be such a blessing and it's accelerated it and made us more productive. So it's not going to be nearly as expensive as we thought. Oh, good. It's still going to cost a fair amount of money. Yeah. And it's not going to take as long as we thought. Awesome. So we're about half done, we think. Uh, we think it'll be a total of about uh, seven years to get the whole thing done. Wow. We're at about three and a half. Okay. All right. Well, we'll look forward to following and, all this. And the website, I'll just say, yeah. is uh, Wilford, wilfordwoodroofpapers.org. Nice. So if you put in uh, wilfordwoodroofpapers.org, it'll come up. Cool. And I know you have your... Your team is active through social media with different oh, things yeah. and quotes, Instagram, and, and all yeah, sorts yeah, all of the stuff. all the things the cool kids are doing yeah. these days. So, <laughs> nice. That's great, nice. Well, um, Steve, this has been great. I just love learning more and more about Wilfred Woodruff and appreciate his service and He's example. A remarkable and, man. Yeah, I, yeah. Someday, I'm going to do a whole another podcast interview with just him in the eternity. So <laughs> it'll be great. Um, just as you reflect on Wilford Woodruff, how has learning about Wilford Woodruff helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? Uh, great question. Well, one is his his testimony of the Savior comes through consistently everything he wrote. Hmm. I mean, so he's always talking about one one of the most interesting parts, which we did early on we decided to do the letters between Phoebe and Wilford. So when Wilford's in England, so in the potteries down at John Benbow's farm and everything, Phoebe is back home. And so the way they communicate is by letter. And they, all their letters bear testimony of the Savior. And it is fascinating. In fact, he learns a baptism for the dead because Phoebe writes it in a letter from a sermon she heard Joseph Smith give. Wow. And and they're so excited. But, you know, you get sad things, too. Uh, Sarah, their daughter, he learns died at age two. Hmm. And he, he's really sad. So is Phoebe. But they close the letter with, but we know where she is. We know what's going on. She's fine. 